Okay, welcome to lesson number five. Um, we are going to put away um, the chess footage for now, and we are going to go to the other folder of footage that uh, was included with um, the course files. Um, so uh, we're going to put away the one project I've been actually actually uh, kind of working on editing the first four lessons here, uh, but I'm going to jump in to a brand new project. So if you were working on the chess footage, go ahead and open up a new project with me, file, new project, or you can press control, alt, in um, to get the new project window. We are going to call this multicam, even though we won't work in this lesson on multicam uh, editing, uh, the stuff that we do will set us up for that. So once we create a new project, you'll notice that um, the old project that we were working on is still here. We can see um, the project window for that. We can see the project window for our new project. We can see the project window for other projects that I was working on as well. So I'm just going to close those panels so I don't see those. And I'm going to go ahead and close out these timelines as well. And here we're at a fresh um, version of Premiere to start our new project. So we're going to go ahead and import that other footage. I'm going to press Control I on my keyboard to uh, do it that way. And then I'm going to head on over to my course items and grab that multicam folder. I'm just going to press import folder here rather than click drag and drop all of the footage because I know I want to bring everything over. All right, so my folders come over, um, and here's what we have in in within that folder. Um, we have a stage right shot, a side stage shot, a wide shot, back camera, a front close up partial song, a low res partial song, and a main camera. Um, so all of these things are um, uh, at least part of one song of a live set uh, from a band that uh, I recorded with a few other um, videographers at the time. This is a few years ago now. Um, and what we'll notice right off the bat uh, on the uh, project window is that uh, we have a whole lot of settings mismatches. So uh, some of these are at 23.976 frames per second. Some of these are at 29.97 frames per second. And then um, let, let me just adjust my metadata here. I'm just going to get rid of everything. And I am going to bring back the two things that I care about. And that is frame rate and video info. Okay, and we'll also see besides just the frame rate issues, we see uh, settings mismatches on um, resolution and um, the pixel aspect ratio for a few of these things as well. Um, so some of the stuff was shot on um, a mini DV video camera, so on tape, and some was shot on um, DSLR. Like at the time, we were kind of moving between um, tape format and solid state uh, media. Uh, so there's a lot of variety here, right? And if I was going to create a new sequence based on any of this footage, I would need to decide what I want to conform everything else to. Um, and there's a few questions about how you would do that. Um, now, normally I would try to conform to the uh, video with the lowest quality that way, it, because if you blow up um, something with a low resolution to a high resolution, you're going to get um, artifacts. But um, if I played through all of this footage, um, I would notice that uh, there's a couple of angles on this where um, I'm probably going to lean towards using that uh, the most, right? Like I'm going to look at these angles and then I'm just going to cut to the other ones every once in a while. Um, so that's kind of what I want to conform to. So in this case, it is a ninth. Uh, 1920 by 1080, 29.97 frames per second 
video file. Um, I notice here also though that there are some issues with how the footage was brought into the program. You see that this guy looks awfully squished uh, vertically, so he's like kind of stretched out um, horizontally. And then I'll see that on a few other videos too. So this one looks just fine and we have that pixel aspect ratio that isn't 1.0 because it is tape. And then I have another one that's 1.33. Let's take a look at this one. There's some lights up and see what that looks like. Hey, that looks okay too. And then we'll look at the next one, wide shot back camera. That one looks okay. It's 720p, but it looks all right there with the pixel aspect ratio. This one looks um, very squished in the opposite way, though. Um, so he's um, squished horizontally or stretched vertically. Um, and that's because this one had an anamorphic adapter on the front of the camera. So it's supposed to get stretched in post-production. So um, this one just ha happened to uh, get brought in incorrectly, and I'm sure that that's a 1.0 uh, pixel aspect ratio. And the other one actually needs to get fixed up uh, because we shot it a particular way. So here's how we're going to do that. We are going to right click the uh, video that we want to change. So that's this one here, this uh, one that's been stretched in a weird way. Right click and go to modify and then interpret footage. And um, if there's any kinds of things that Premiere may have read incorrectly, it's really important that you understand that you know um, what kind of footage you're bringing in here and what kind of frame rate it was shot at, all of the things that like a director of photography would know. That way, if there is some kind of metadata issue, uh, you can correct it in the actual program. So we're getting a little bit more advanced here. Um, we are uh, going to conform this pixel aspect ratio here from 1.33 to square pixels at 1.0 and we'll see now our video has been corrected um, and then we'll head on over to that low res partial song that needs to be corrected in the opposite direction we'll right click that go to modify and then interpret footage again and we will conform this one to um, two to one or 2.0. Um, so it's gonna uh, be two pixels wide uh, for every one pixel tall. So there are other things that you can do in the interpret footage area. Um, if you have a frame rate mismatch, like uh, it, it happens to read your footage as 60 frames per second when it really should be 24 frames per second. This happens very often if someone uh, maybe sends you some animated stuff, like if uh, it's an exported video from Adobe After Effects, and or maybe it's like a JPEG sequence file, so it's a series of still images um, that's intended to be played back as a video. Uh, you can adjust that frame rate to be maybe 23.976 or 24 frames per second, and that should work there. Um, there's also the ability, uh, you also have the ability to change um, the field order again. So um, if you were working with tape and it shouldn't have an upper field first or lower field, or it should have an upper field first or a lower field first versus a progressive scan. You can certainly um, add that there. And then if you're working with uh, VR uh, footage, which we won't really cover in here, uh, you have some ability to tell it, hey, this is indeed VR footage and treat it as such. Okay. There's also audio channels up here, and we can get to this same um, this same window uh, by right clicking in our timeline and going to audio channels. But if um, if you happen to have um, like one microphone coming through the left channel as mono, and then another microphone coming through the right channel as mono, and you want just to hear the stuff coming from the left channel or just the stuff coming from the right channel through both channels, through both of your speakers, um, you can adjust that here as well, okay? And uh, what's really helpful about the newer uh, Premiere is you can preview left and right channels to know which one's coming from the left and which one's coming from the right. If you have your headphones turned on the, the wrong way, right? Like you put your head left 
cuff on the right ear, you might um, do the inverse of what you intend to do. Okay, I'm just going to press OK there, and now my video is a little bit better. Um, so before we try to do anything in terms of a multi-cam um, edit, what we need to do is uh, get all these things looking like they should look. So um, if this is the ideal, the main camera here, um, let's try to get these other uh, clips to look relatively similar since they look uh, very, very different. Okay, so I'm just going to drop my main cam into my timeline. That way everything's going to be conformed to that. Now I'm going to drop um, the next clip or the first clip that I want to work with uh, right next to it. So the main cam looks like it fills out the whole frame and the front cam actually look very, very close. So um, I don't have to change the size of this. Um, I don't have to mess with any of that. Uh, and maybe I mess with the color just a little bit, but uh, nothing too drastic there. Now I'm going to drop in the low res partial video. And that looks okay too. Um, so it looks like it fills out the frame entirely. Maybe it fills out too much of the frame. It certainly does. Um, so if I scale that down to 70, then I can see the entirety of the video. Let's check on that front camera just in case. So if I scale that down, yep, that is exactly the same size as my main camera, so that's great. Uh, this one, if I want to keep the black bars when I flip back and forth, I can leave it here. I can also um, scale that up, so it's kind of like what we did in the export window if we want it to fill out the frame without stretching anything in an, um, a natural kind of way, we can do that. Uh, there's a couple of better ways to do this than uh, using the scale here, though. Uh, if we right-click any clip and we go to set to frame size, uh, we can just jump it directly to uh, the frame size. So it's going to be exactly um, the scale it needs to be to fill out the frame. Now there is scale to frame size as well. If you turn both of those things on, it's not going to do exactly what you want. So there is scale to frame size as well. If we right click, go to scale to frame size, it's gonna do um, essentially uh, the same thing as set to frame size, except for set to frame size will adjust the scale under motion here. And scale to frame size will either just scale down the video or scale up the video. Um, without messing with your uh, video motion effect. I'm just going to switch that back to set to frame size. And I am going to leave the, that little bit of letterboxing there because uh, it's an interesting kind of look to have it stretched out like that. Okay, uh, I'm going to keep working my way down here. Wide shot back camera. Drop that on the timeline. And it is a little bit small. It's 720p. So we are going to do a similar thing. We're right click and go to set to frame size. Now it's blown up. No letterboxing, fits the frame perfectly. Um, color is definitely a little bit different than the last one, so we'll keep that in mind. Stage right, another clip, dragging and dropping, and we have, again, something a little bit smaller that looks about like 720p. And we're going to right-click and go to Set to Frame Size. And then finally, Side Stage. That's our last clip along the way. Drag, drop and right click. It's very, very small, but we are still going to go ahead and go to set to frame size. And we see these letter boxes on the right side, which maybe I don't like as much as uh, the letter boxing at the top and bottom. Uh, top and bottom looks cinematic and sides don't that much. So maybe I'll just scale that up a little bit further um, to fill out my frame entirely. This one is scaled up dramatically though. So we know that um, this is probably our 
least likely or uh, least desirable angle to cut to uh, when we work in our multicam sequence. All right, now that we have our sizes conformed all to the, uh, all to the clip that we like, uh, this main camera clip, we are going to start um, working with color grading. Now you could just work um, with effects, and if you're familiar with Photoshop and stuff, remember all of those uh, adjustment layer effects that are in Photoshop are in, uh, in the effects tab in Premiere. We can click, drag, and drop those things and adjust them accordingly. So if you wanted to add curves, you could certainly add curves. But if we click on the uh, Color Workspace tab at the top of our screen here, we'll see that we now have Lumetri Color selected. And Lumetri Color is um, kind of like Essential Graphics. It's all of your color grading tools or all of your color color tools, um, and uh, they're all in one place, so they're nice and easy to get. It, they do act as an effect on your clip, so as soon as you make an adjustment on Lumetri Color, so let's just do that really quickly. I'm going to click on my main, uh, main camera clip, and then I'm going to make a basic adjustment. So if I go under Basic Correction, and I'm going to make it darker. I'm just going to turn down the exposure. As soon as I did that, you saw right over here Lumetri Color showed up. I'll do that again for you. Control Z, Control Z. No Lumetri Color over on my effect controls. And then I adjust that exposure and now it pops up. Okay, um, so it does work just like an effect in um, on your videos and stuff, uh, but that one effect controls so many things in terms of color grading, so you don't have uh, several effects in here. And then uh, consider that sort of application with something like masking, which we learned about in the effects um, tutorial. So if you wanted to create a mask and do um, curves and brightness and contrast and saturation controls and exposure controls um, you wouldn't have to copy and paste that mask over and over again instead you'd only have to do the one mask um, and all of those effects are uh, inside that single effect um, in your clip effect controls that was a lot of effects words sorry Okay, so uh, in Lumetri Color, there are a ton of tools, but since we are working with uh, trying to match two images, what we might want to do is make, um, make our lives a little bit easier and see two images at the same time. So in our program monitor here, we can add a button. And here's that button. It is Comparison View. If we click, drag, and drop that guy down here, press OK, we can see a Comparison View. So now we have two views at the same time. Um, the reference area here, I can scrub through my timeline and find uh, an area that I like. Maybe, maybe I want to match everything man these lights change so much it's crazy right um, so I can kind of scrub through there and find some things that I like from my first clip and take a look at my second clip and see what needs to change so we're looking over at these cowbells here and our lead singer so let's take a look at what he looks like when the lights hit him okay there he is there and are the lights at full blast? Yep, they sure are. So that's lights not at full blast. Let's find if we can see him a little bit darker. Okay, so here's our first shot and here's our second shot. We're not too terribly far from there. Um, so anything that we're adjusting is actually under this current view. So if I make an adjustment to exposure and turn that down a little bit, it's not affecting um, our reference uh, area unless our reference clip, our reference, um, what we're seeing in our reference view here is the same clip as the thing that we're working on. We're working on the second clip and our reference is our first clip, so that's perfect. So our reference does look a little bit darker, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn down that exposure just a little bit. I could also turn up or down my contrast. Remember, contrast just means that your brights get brighter and your darks get darker. 
I could mess with temperature, which would make our image cooler or warmer. And I might just uh, move that back and forth to see what I can get here. It looks like it might be a little bit warmer in our uh, reference clip here, just a hair though. Uh, we can um, tint our image either green or uh, magenta in that direction. So we could go really far if we needed to. But maybe I just want to kind of keep things close to white over here. All right, uh, we can adjust our contrast in a much more precise way by using highlights, shadows, blacks, and whites, right? So um, whites are the highest end of your waveform. Your uh, blacks are the lowest end of your waveform, and your shadows and highlights are on the high ends and low ends, um, respectively, but they aren't at the absolute ends. So um, if you want to see how this actually works, though, uh, what we need to do is look at our Lumetri scopes, which we don't see right off the bat, but you can see it's kind of hidden over here in a tab. If I click that on, I can see a waveform monitor. And if I right click this, I can see all sorts of uh, color grading help for us. We can add an RGB parade. We can also add a histogram or a vector scope. Um, or another kind of vector scope here. So if you're familiar with maybe a histogram from Photoshop, you can certainly look at that to judge your colors based on. Uh, you can also use your vector scopes, uh, either vector scope, to uh, judge what kind of um, what kind of saturation levels are there in your image um, and just how cool or warm your image looks overall. Uh, but what I really like to use is the waveform monitor and then maybe the RGB parade. I don't like to have all of these things up at the same time because it gets a little bit cluttered. So I'm just going to ditch everything except for maybe the waveform and RGB parade. So what these two things are, this waveform um, is going to show you your image from the left side all the way to the right side. Um, so it's going to read just like your image does left to right. Left side of your frame is here. Right side of your frame is here. The center of your frame is here. And then all of this stuff, this IRE scale or millivolt scale, uh, refers to how bright your image is. So if you are at zero millivolts and zero IRE, um, that means that you have a pure black on your screen. It is completely black. There's no color there. It is black, black, black. And if you are at 100, that means you are at a pure white. It is as white as your video can get. All of this stuff in between, um, these lower areas are shadows, these higher areas are highlights. Now, um, keeping that in mind, you can adjust where these things lie. Uh, and you can do that through these highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks, and then a plethora of other tools that you might like more or less. Okay, so here's uh, where the RGB parade comes in. So this is a left to right readout of your image. In fact, let's just play forward a little bit and you can see, oh, it is lagging like crazy on this computer since I'm doing um, uh, screen capture at the same time. So maybe that won't work as well for us, but you can see um, since we have both the reference here and the current version here, we can see the reference, what the reference looks like, and we can see what the current uh, frame looks like as well. The same goes for your RGB parade, only it's red, green, and blue channels, each separated into their own waveform. Since we have uh, have this like comparison view up the RGB parade might not be the best way to go for us Instead, I'll just deal with the waveform monitor and we can see right here that there's a pretty significant mismatch from our reference to our um, Current frame, but that's because we had a big blast of light when we scrubbed forward now We're both in the dark here, um, but there's still a pretty big mismatch We can see this line between those two things and if we're attempting to match this 
to this, we can try to get these uh, this middle area to match up as well as possible. So if I turn down my exposure in that area, maybe I was incorrect, but maybe I wasn't because if I turn that up, it kind of stretches out. So the low or the high end here is now in the right place, but the low end is off. Uh, but what we can do to be a little bit more refined here is mess with maybe the shadows and blacks and kind of lift those up. All right, now all of a sudden, this looks so much more similar to uh, this area here. What we also see are these spikes of red, and you can tell that, that those spikes of red are intentionally red because there's a big red light behind them and stuff. But uh, in theory, um, our highlights, let's just try to find a highlight real quick. So big bright light there. And then let's try to find a big bright light here where it doesn't strike the lens but maybe it's on a person okay it's on a person here and uh, it's not too not too bad here so uh, we do have a big bright light that is clipping at 100 and it is an actual light source um, and it looks like it actually a lot of this is on his face here. So it's as bright as it can be. So maybe um, we could pull that down a little bit if we wanted to. I have a feeling that that's kind of burnt in with the camera because this is a little bit older footage. Um, but um, we can also maybe adjust the black levels a little bit to get them kind of closer to here. And now we've... Um, I, th I would assume that we've come pretty close at a just cursory glance trying to get this stuff done uh, kind of quickly um, in our image from image one to image two. Uh, if we look at the overall, we have this nice um, green. Um, green is coming through in the shadows or is lower in the shadows than red. You can see the red above that and then the blue above that. Uh, and in this case, the red is closer to the green. You see how it's like turning yellow because it overlaps and the blue is above that. So it's not too terribly far off. It is a little bit off though. So uh, we can adjust the color casts in these different areas as well. Uh, if we jump on over to um, the color wheels and match area we can um, not only do very similar things to what we just did by turning up or down the shadows with these sliders here just press Control z and get that out of there uh, but we can also adjust the uh, colors of these given areas maybe the highlights are just a little bit high i'm going to pull those down just a little bit uh, on my current frame here and then I'm going to mess with my shadows because my green and red should be closer together. I can push um, away from the red and the reds will come down. Uh, but my blues have now gone up too high. So I'm going to just get it so that I get a little bit of yellow in there, but not too much yellow. All right. So there we go, our greens and reds are now overlapping just like the original image and the blue is above that. So our shadows look good here. Our mid-tones, we have uh, this big green spike in here and then some yellow. The mid-tones are always gonna be the most difficult area to judge um, just because there's so much variety in color and there's so much context that matters. If there's a red light there, obviously it should be red, right? Um, the highlights uh, also look like they are very similar. We have this uh, magenta line dead center. We have green underneath that and we have blue above that. So it looks like um, our shooters between these two cameras had their uh, camera settings adjusted to be very similar, which is great. Now, um, with that kind of overlapping color, if you see any white, and you should see a little bit of white right here, that means that these colors are completely balanced. Any white in your waveform will mean that you have either gray, black, or white, and usually it's some form of gray. That means that it's got some kind of white balance in there. Now, that doesn't mean that... Um, you should have that throughout your image for like balance throughout your image because that context again does matter. Like if you had um, this area uh, as a white waveform, you wouldn't want that guitar to turn gray because it's not gray in real life, right? 
Okay, so I'm just going to switch over my Lumetri scopes from the waveform monitor into a vector scope. Either vector, vector scope is just fine. I'm going to ditch out the um, waveform monitor here and take a look at my shots. So I'll just toggle off the um, comparison view, off and on. And it looks like that first image has a lot more saturation. So I can just jump over here and take a look at that. And you see how that cloud of uh, the cloud is reaching out into the reds pretty significantly. Um, I would say that that's a little bit too much saturation for me. And then if I look at the other angle, it's all very... Um, it's all very restrained in this small area. Now that might not be enough for me here. So um, maybe I'll split the difference between these two cameras. I'm gonna turn up the saturation on my first camera, or my second camera, sorry. And I'm gonna turn down the saturation on my other camera. All right, now, both of them are within a rel like they jump up and down as those lights fly in and stuff, but they never go outside of the bounds um, in your vector scope. So I'd say that that's a good start, and we're just going to work our way through all of these videos, and I'll do a quick time lapse for you as I do that. All right, so I worked through um, all six of these shots. I didn't do extensive color grading work, um, but I did do some basic primary correction. So that is a big thing as we do color grading, we do primary correction, and then we do some secondary correction. So the primary correction should be just kind of uniformly um, uh, getting all of your images looking about the same and making them look normal in case, you know, um, you had a white balance issue or something like that. Um, so there are a ton of other things inside Lumetri Color that we can work on. Um, there are um, creative controls, which I would actually recommend you kind of stay away from. Um, these are very similar to... Um, uh, like Instagram filter stuff. So if you wanted to have like a faded film look, you could turn that up and it essentially just brings your black levels up uh, here. You can sharpen, and I do think that this is the only place that you can find uh, sharpen controls, which, you know, um, can come in handy a little bit. Uh, you have vibrance, if you're familiar with vibrance from um, Photoshop's uh, camera raw filter. It's something kind of similar to saturation. And then there is uh, saturation control, you know, color, intensity basically um, underneath that uh, the saturation control does appear in basic correction as well uh, if you choose either one of these things it's going to do the same thing you turn up the saturation the more um, uh, color intensity you get there is a shadow tint shadow tint and a highlight tint uh, available here so lots of people like to put um, some blue in their shadows specifically that way it really doesn't mess with you know skin tones that much in your mid-tones um, or add a highlight tint which is a little bit more um, uh, apparent so if i jump into something that actually has some shadows and highlights you can see uh, what's going on there that is pure highlight. All right, so here we have some shadows and highlights. If I push my shadow tint blue, you can see how uh, my video uh, has adjusted there, and I can push my highlight tint blue, and you can see how my video is adjusted. So the bright parts of my image are now tinted blue. Um, and then you can do some tint balance as well. So if you happen to do some adjust where those hues land, you know, it's uh, like playing with the uh, with the uh, tint 
up in the basic correction, but it's for these shadows and highlights. If you want to reset any element in uh, Lumetri Color, all you have to do is double click that and it'll jump back to um, its starting point. Uh, if you want to reset an entire area, oh, if you want to reset the entirety of Lumetri Color, you can click this uh, little reset effect here and it will reset everything back to its uh, original state. We won't do that since we have some stuff that we actually like here. Okay, um, there are curves underneath this, and a whole lot of people really like curves. I'm one of those people. Uh, uh, there's um, a lot of people that like curves more than me, even though, uh, and they'll use um, this uh, kind of S curve. It's a contrast curve, rather than using like contrast controls or um, even your color wheel. So just like in Premiere, there's a bunch of ways to achieve the same um, objective in um, your color grading suite here um, it, it's the same exact way so if we wanted to add um, some contrast to our image essentially we're taking our shadows and moving them downward and taking our highlight area and moving it upward and then we gain interest th through this midtone area so this midtone the midtones are stretched out with the high ends of the midtones uh, a little bit higher than they normally would be and the low ends of the mid-tones being a little bit darker, like the shadows. Okay, since we already adjusted those things through color wheels and uh, basic correction, we won't mess with that. Uh, but you will notice, oh, you can also um, click on red, green, and blue channels and uh, adjust those separately. So if you, the, the green in this image, right, like um, pretend that there's not a green gel on them right now. If the green in this background was a little bit too much for us, we could pull that down specifically, the green channel, or we could lift the green channel up specifically, or we could lift it up in the highlights and bring it down in the shadows. Um, all of that is also available to you for red, green, and blue channels uh, separately. Uh, underneath this, we have uh, hue saturation curves. That's what they have it listed in um, Premiere. And here's basically how this works. Uh, you, um, you select this and you adjust this. So you select a hue, which is a color range, and then you adjust that hue's saturation. So if we know um, saturation is the intensity of a color, if we maybe, here's this guy with a red shirt here, if we put two nodes on the outer edges of the red here, and then we put one more node and click and drag that, so that's that red channel, we are now, um, adjusting the saturation for that red. So if we lift that way up there, you can see his shirt got super vibrant and red. And if we bring that down, it'll turn totally gray. If we didn't like the red in our uh, shot here, we could do it that way. Um, hue, and hue versus saturation is probably the one that you'll mess with more than anything else. Hue versus hue is also an option. So once again, with a red shirt, put a node on both sides of red and we are selecting the red and we are adjusting its color so now as we lift this thing up we can see that the red is changing colors um, and then there's some red on his face there too uh, the lead singer's face so we can see that that is getting adjusted with this so we could maybe refine those nodes if we needed to hue versus luma luminance here so that's brightness so once again the red shirt we are selecting out the uh, red in this image and now we can adjust how bright that red is so we can bring that down or lift that up um, anytime that you have some kind of luminance property like a highlight and you bring that underneath say like a mid-tone or a shadow you're going to get some weird looking stuff so um, as we do that our reds here um, mostly in highlights so if we turn that down you can see this weird kind of artifacting starting to happen there on the face okay if we keep moving down we'll see luminance or luma versus saturation so we can actually select out the brighter part of this image which includes his face and that t-shirt and we start to pull that up and we can see hey his face there has gotten way more saturated it turned yellow uh, he has yellow in his face but we don't see that much of it because there's not that much saturation there 
Um, so that's an option for us. I'll just double click here and get rid of those nodes. And then saturation versus saturation as well. So if you want to select out the saturation and adjust its saturation, you can do that. So you can maybe take the um, most saturated portions of your video and turn that up. Maybe it needs to stretch out just a little bit more. Okay, there we get a little bit of his shirt. So as we lift that up, you can see the saturated part of his shirt becomes much more saturated, and we can bring that down too. So below these, um, these uh, the curves area, we have color wheels and match. We looked at these color wheels already, but we didn't look at um, the uh, match option. So uh, the match option is a uh, automatic correction. So if you have two images and you can line them up perfectly, which I can't, let's just see how well this works. So we have th this drummer guy and we have the lead singer. If we say, hey, apply a match between this and this, it, uh, the AI will do its best to kind of match those colors. And it didn't do a perfect job here because I'm not uh, selected on the right frame for this, uh, but it did an okay job. So if you happen to be in a place where you need to, um, you're not sure where to start, um, this could be a really good starting place for you. You know that your two images are different, um, but you're not sure exactly how and this uh, this waveform monitor is really too complex for you to work and stuff, you can always try this. Likewise, under basic correction, we can find this auto adjust. So if we click the auto adjust, it's gonna do what it thinks is best to make the most pleasing image. And it didn't do a very good job there. And generally auto uh, correct doesn't do the best job in the world. It really likes to add a whole lot of contrast to your image. And uh, if you don't have a pure white, um, it's going to have a hard time uh, deciding what kind of tint or temperature to set your image at. Okay, um, so that's color wheels and match beyond just what we did before. HSL secondary is where we can get really uh, complicated. So uh, HSL secondary, uh, we can actually pull a key um, so we can select out a specific area of our image. Let's just jump out of the comparison view real quick um, so I don't crash my computer here. Um, I will select out, let's just go with his red shirt again. Um, so uh, I click the red shirt and you see hue, saturation, and luminance properties. It says that pixel that you selected uh, exists in this hue range, in the saturation range, and this luminance range. We don't see anything right now, but if we click on this color gray option, we see what we've actually selected out. Now there's a couple of things that we can do to kind of refine this since it only got a portion of his shirt there. Uh, we can click the uh, add um, the add eyedropper and we can add some pixels there and it got some more pixels when we turn on the color gray. Uh, we can also to, uh, do the the uh, subtract eyedropper and maybe we want to say don't get his face here and we still got a piece of his face. Maybe this darker part of his face is what we got there. Maybe I'll just keep on the uh, gray and I'll click that part of his face. There it goes. All right. Um, I just had some trouble getting those pixels, but once I click that, those pixels are now removed from my range. Uh, we can also uh, expand these ranges. So if we want to expand the red area, the red hue, we can do that. And we can see that it's not doing much for a shirt, but it is bringing that face back, so we probably don't want to do that. We can also expand the saturation range, also bring back that face, but not much for his shirt. We can also click and drag these um, bars to go left and right on the saturation hue or luminance areas. We can turn up the luminance and now all of a sudden we're getting a lot more of his shirt and that's probably what we want. Um, that darker area of our video. And this little ramp here is the fall off, right? So if we put that really um, 
like at a really steep fall off it won't like kind of fade from the um, darker reds into even darker reds it'll just uh, hard cut out it as soon as it hits that pixel range okay i can also i can go back and maybe try to get rid of some of those facial features there that helps there um, and then uh, let's just turn that off and see how much of a shirt we got well we got a good portion of it there okay uh, if our selection looks a little bit funky around the outside edges if we just jump to a hundred percent here and use our hand tool try to find that shirt okay so it's not a perfect selection we have <clears throat> a lot of uh, weird out outer pixels that we might want to clean up we can use the denoise and blur sliders to clean that stuff up denoise will clean up um, some noise uh, that might appear in that area and then the blur will uh, clean up those outside edges so um, the denoise you can turn up uh, considerably more than the blur. The more you turn up the blur, the more um, you're starting to mess with some pixels that you maybe don't want to mess with, especially if you're going to do some kind of very stark uh, adjustment. Okay. So I'm just going to jump back to a fit so I can see what we're at the entirety of the frame. I'll turn off the color gray and I know that I've made a selection that I like. Even though I didn't get all of the shirt here, I could probably refine it a little bit further. Okay, from here um, I can turn down the brightness of my shirt or turn up the brightness of my shirt. So it's just a regular color wheel. So under HSL secondary, these are all your selection tools and everything underneath it are the correctors for it. I can change the color of that area of the shirt that we've selected. And then I can add, um, change the temperature, the tint, the contrast, the sharpen, and the saturation all work exactly the same as uh, what we saw in those earlier items on Lumetri color. I can sharpen it up or de-sharpen it. Finally, in Lumetri Color, we have this vignette, uh, which means that it, it either darkens or brightens the outer edges of your video. Um, so as we turn the amount up, we'll see our uh, edges get brighter. As we turn the amount down, we'll see them get a little bit darker. Uh, again, this is something very... Um, uh, similar to Instagram filter stuff um, so a little goes a long way with this stuff but if I wanted to add a little bit of a vignette and kind of focus our attention towards the middle of the frame I could certainly do that and that actually looks a little bit better um, I can also adjust where the midpoint is like how how um, how much should those outer edges come in um, again a little goes a long way here how round do you want your um, your vignette to be. You can make yours very square or you can really round that out in less of a rectangle. Uh, and then you can feather those edges more or less too. So if you turn that way down you can actually see what's going on here. There's a, a ellipse shape um, in your um, in your frame and you're adjusting that. So if we turn down the roundness now you can see what's actually happening and you can see that it can turn completely round if we want. Okay, I'm just going to uh, ditch all of my vignetting because what I could do if I really wanted to mess with all of this stuff at the same time, once I get a nice uh, clean correction here, I could do um, a lot of secondaries as an adjustment layer. But if we click that new item, we can create a new adjustment layer and it's going to be the same size and uh, frame rate as our uh, sequence. We can click and drag and drop that and stretch that across all of our videos. And now if I wanted to do any kind of uh, creative color control here, I could do that um, without messing with the Lumetri stuff that I had on these individual clips. So if I wanted to make everything blue, now I've added that everything blue to all of my clips. So it is a really helpful um, way to not get yourself uh, in a position where you've done some really great color grading work and then you wanted to try something uh, creative and you tried to add it to uh, six different clips and messed things up and you have to start from scratch. Those adjustment layers can be significant in that way.
So now that I'm happy with all of my color correction work um, throughout all of these clips, uh, I want to do something so I can kind of retain that work. Now there's a couple of things that we can do uh, inside Lumetri Color, and that is we can create presets and we can create um, LUTs. So uh, there's this little area that I neglected to tell you about with um, with basic correction that says input LUT. So uh, if you've downloaded any LUTs from third parties and stuff, this is how you would apply them um, to your work in Premiere. You would just click on that drop down, uh, click the browse button, and go and find where your LUT is saved, and it would adjust. You wouldn't see any adjustments in Lumetri Color, but it would adjust your image, and you could adjust from there. Okay, if you want to create your own LUT based on what you've done, all you have to do is right click the Lumetri Color tab and you can export a dot look or a dot cube depending on um, what kind of output you want there. Um, that will create a LUT that you can then import back into Premiere if you want. You can share with your friends if you want and it's cross-platform. So if you wanted to send that out to somebody who maybe uses uh, DaVinci Resolve or um, Final Cut Pro, they can all import your LUT um, into their program. Now, if you know that you're just working inside Premiere, you can make this into a preset, and that's going to be a little bit better uh, for uh, people working exclusively in Premiere because a LUT isn't going to uh, retain things like those secondary color corrections. So to uh, create a preset in Lumetri Color, all you have to do is right click that same area and we can click Save Preset and we can name it whatever we want. So if we called this um, Band uh, Color Correction, and even though this is only going to um, work for that one angle. We'll just call it that just to demonstrate. And then um, remember that Lumetri Color is an effect. So if we head on over to our effects tab, so remember when we were looking at the effects rack here and we saw a bunch of things beyond video effects and video transitions, we saw presets and Lumetri presets. Now Lumetri presets are a bunch of presets um, from the Lumetri Color uh, library. So if we wanted to see what a two-strip Technicolor would look would be like on our video, we could click, drag, and drop that one onto our video, and it did not a whole lot, but maybe we can try a different one. Let's try, um, oh, it was there and then it was gone. Okay, uh, let's try uh, a monochrome. So we're going to see some black and white stuff. And if I kind of pull this over a little bit I can see what it's supposed to do so monochrome faded looks pretty uh, drastic so if I click drag and drop that onto my video I get this nice uh, maybe not so nice black and white with really faded uh, blacks okay so um, all those are like made for Lumetri and stuff but we have uh, under just presets here um, presets that we've created and saved inside uh, Premiere. So band color correction, that thing that we just created there, I could click, drag, and drop it, and it should actually do something. Yeah, it doubled up the color grading stuff that we did on there before. We don't want to do that, though. Um, it's already on there, so we're happy. But if there were several instances of this um, or several clips that matched but were multiple clips, I could click and drag and drop that on as many clips as I wanted to without having to make that adjustment over and over again. The same goes for any kind of effect that you have. If you've uh, done something very specific that you want to apply to multiple clips, you can right click any of those effects and click Save Preset. And then you have the option to name it. So um, let's say uh, Rescale Property. And I save that. And now Rescale Property is inside my effects presets and I can click drag and drop that stuff. It is also searchable. So if I search for Rescale, um, it's going to pop up. So that's it for our fifth lesson on uh, color grading inside Adobe Premiere. Um, we will continue to work with the same footage on a multicam sequence starting with the next lesson.